Josh Rubble here with Making Bank. Today's guest going to blow your mind, really dive deep into understanding who you are, how you, how as an entrepreneur, what really got you started, as well as some different tips and stuff on multifamily and things like that. But what is that inspiration? What's driving you? Are you really finding that passion in what you're doing? Are you just sitting out there trying to understand what you're doing here? So today's guest, Jerome Myers, is going to help you figure that out. So tune in to today's episode and just get ready to be mind blown. Hey, also too, guys, if you love this freedom gear, gratitude gear, amazing gratitude quotes, uh, go check out gratitudegear.com. They have the best, the softest clothing, hoodies, t-shirts, hats, whatever you like. It's there for you. You can grab freedom gear, you can grab gratitude gear, you can grab truth gear, whatever that is, whatever you want to celebrate out there. So again, check out gratitudegear.com. Use the code MAKINGBANK in the number 10, making bank 10 for 10% off your first purchase and gratitudegear.com. Thanks. I think so many of us live in a world where we've been told that we need to be practical, we need to be realistic, but nothing special comes from those places. What you need to be is radical. What you need to be is a, a little uh, obsessed with creating these outcomes for whoever you've been placed on this earth to serve. Next up, representing Primal Life Organics, Josh Making Bank Felber. Welcome to Making Bank. I am Josh Felber, where we uncover the mindset and the success strategies of the top 1% so you can amplify your life and your business today. Super excited and honored for today's guest, Jerome Myers, aka J, is a developer of people and places. He's the founder and chief inspiration officer of Dream Catchers and the Myers Development Group. Through these entities, he gets to live out his childhood dreams of helping people manifest the things that they imagine and create social proof that dreams should be real. So true. Since leaving corporate America after building a $20 million division, Jay has become one of the most sought after thought leaders in the multifamily development space. His company, the Myers Development Group, built a multi-million dollar portfolio following the principles of his Myers method. So I'm excited to welcome Jerome Myers, aka Jay, to Making Bank today. Josh, so good to be with you, man. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Uh, well, tell me a little bit about what got you started. When you got started as an entrepreneur, did you kind of were you in like one of those kid entrepreneur guys, or did it kind of happen later in life? So kind of fill us in and get, get us get us up to speed. Yeah, I think there were two things that were early indicators. The first was selling candy at school. I was a kid with a go to Sam's Club. In the locker, there's a box of chocolate. We're doing transactions in between classes. And after that, maybe before that, I can't even remember, was taking dad's lawnmower and pushing it around the neighborhood, knocking on the door and saying, hey, your yard's a little high. Would you mind, would you be interested in a yard cut today? And I'll never forget making, I don't know, it had to be two or $300 one day. And going to buy a pair of shoes and I was like oh yeah I didn't have to ask anybody for it this is the <laughs> deal but I realized pretty quickly like it's hard right knocking mm. on doors making sales that that's hard and if people don't know you for doing that thing they're not likely to come to you to get that solution and so I, I put down the grass cutting it was really hot and really hard and the candy, you know, doing one and two dollar transactions is only going to get you so far. Right. And so <laughs> and I was doing OK in school and I had a conversation with my physics teacher and I said, hey, Mr. Ayers, what should I do? I like solving problems, but I'm not sure if I should do it with math and science or with people. And he said, well, Jerome, the engineer gets paid a lot more than a psychologist. And I said, well, I, my mom told me at five that. uh I needed to 
choose a profession that was going to allow me to live the lifestyle I wanted to live. And Josh, I, I, I told this, these stories out of a chronological sequence, but here's the thing, man. So when I was outside with my mom, I was four or five, and my favorite day was Thursday. On Thursday, the trash truck came, and it would come, and Lonnie was always hanging off the back, and he had that little rock as things were going down the street. He'd hop off, he'd do the pirouette, tip the lid off of the, the top of the garbage can. It would spin around like a top and then fall flat. He'd do the pirouette, dump the trash into the back, and then spin it back to the corner like a Frisbee, right? And it would never fall over. It always hit perfectly. And it just used to, that part excited me. But the thing that I, I got most excited about was when he pulled the handle, man. And if Baby Shark was around back then, my rendition of getting him to pull the handle would have been just like all these kids running around doing the Baby Shark dance, right? I just wanted him to pull it. And when he pulled and crushed the trash, I would go nuts. And it was just so cool. And it yeah. wasn't that as much as it was Lonnie's ability to be at home when his kids came home from school. There was this level of freedom. So he worked early and then he was off late. And that was something that I wanted. And so I looked at my mom one of those Thursdays and I said, hey, I want to be a trash man when I grow up. And she looked at me in the eyes and said, baby, you know, you like your Jordache jeans and do you like your Nikes? Because if you do, you have to choose a profession that's going to pay you the amount of money you need to, in order to live the lifestyle that you want to live. And I was like, man. But I really like this concept of freedom. I, I felt like Lonnie was free. My dad didn't come home till after dark sometimes because he worked a Carolina half day. For him, it was six to six every day. Sure. He was just gone every day, grinding in the military. And that was when my mom said, well, maybe you, you can't be a trash man or you shouldn't be a trash man, but you should own the company because then you can be inside and outside when you want. And you can actually earn what you want. And so that was my first introduction into entrepreneurship and the concept of you don't just have to get a job. Now, I didn't have any entrepreneurs in my family, so I went the traditional route, went to school and got an engineering degree and started in that profession. But that was when that concept was introduced. And I didn't realize that until today when you asked me that question, man. <laughs> no, that's that's cool. I like. I mean, that's a great story. And, you know, understanding kind of, what planted that seed and what, you know, really um, kind of spurred that drive for you and everything. Uh, so what time, um, so obviously, you know, you, you're in school, uh, engineering degree, start working, you know, obviously for a company, I would suspect. <laughs> what what kind of then got you the switch from what you were doing on a daily basis to uh, moving into entrepreneurship from there? Yeah, so... I got a phone call at 4.55 on January 24th that went something like this. Hey, Jerome, we're going to lay him off. Mm. What do you mean? Yeah, half of them got to go. I know you and I have been going back and forth about this for a while, but I made a choice. I made a decision, and the decision is that half of them need to go. I'm like, yeah, no, that's not the right answer. And he said, Jerome, this isn't a discussion. I'm informing you of a decision that's been made. And, of course, I try to retort, and he's like, you know what? It's 4.59 on Christmas Eve. I'm going to go spend the rest of the year with my family. I will talk to you in the new year. And then I got the three beeps that iPhones make when a call is disconnected or ended. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there looking at the phone. And I've got this sinking feeling in my stomach because I never had to do this before. And so I was employee number two on January 13th. And by September 30th, I had 175 people on my team. That year, we did $20 million in revenue and 30% profit. And so for the life of me, I couldn't understand why I needed to fire people when I made $6 million in profit right. for the company. And, you know, it, 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 I watched layoffs. I had a mentor who was had his level in the organization eliminated back in 2009. And I was like, there has to be a fair way to do this and there has to be an equitable way to do this. I, I don't want anybody to say, Oh, they just kept their friends. So how can we evaluate people's performance and see who actually were the highest, most productive people. And so I spent the next two weeks trying to figure that out. And then I came back, we made the organizational changes, put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And I promised myself I would never do that again. 
I said they made me do it. And when I said they made me do it, I gave up all my agency. Well, two days before Thanksgiving of the following year, I'm having a conversation to go something like this. Hey, guys, I know Black Friday's coming. Please don't spend all your money. I'm not going to share what's going to happen between now and the end of the year. And it was at that point I felt like I lost all my leadership credibility. And it was at that point I decided I was going to exit the matrix. I was going to leave corporate America and go do something where they couldn't tell me what to do. Today, when I look back on it, I realize I chose to participate and I could have decided not to do that. Mm. But I did. And today I, I want to be in a true position of the buck stops with me instead of trying to pass the buck when people are having conversations about things that need to be done or people feel like they need to be done. I had all of I had the illusion of being an entrepreneur because I talked to my supervisor every other week. I saw him once a quarter. I was on the ground. It was my PL. It was I was responsible for all the things that were happening, but I didn't have final say. Right. And I, I needed that. I, I I had to get in a place where it was actually my ship. It was my boat. Hmm. Yeah, that's so true. It's I mean, we feel that, you know, as we're growing and doing things, you know, that we are in that position. And, and then, you know, when, when it comes down to it and those changes happen or things like that and, and major events occur, we realize, Oh, <laughs> I guess I wasn't in the position that I thought it was in originally. Yeah. And so that got amplified even more, Josh, because when I walked out, I was a guy, I was doing all this leadership stuff because when you grow that fast, I had a bunch of leaders who, weren't actually leaders. And so they needed development in order to perform in the role because people who never had people reporting to them were now the people we were relying on to deliver the result. Right. And I thought, Oh, well, you know, people will hire me back. Right. I'm, I'm the guy. I was the one that helped us accomplish the impossible, of course. And I, I could come back as a consultant and nobody wanted to take a meeting with me. Right. Nobody had any. And I, it was at that point where I really realized that it was just the title. It wasn't me. Right. And it was a very humbling experience. And so I had to go to zero. And the other place where I thought it became really important and kind of one of these transformational moments, these quake moments was I was working in a fitness center over the summer between uh, I think it was my sophomore and my junior year in college and no, it was actually my freshman in my sophomore year. And I closed up early. It was four 45. We closed at five. I was like, nobody's coming in to get a workout in the last 15 minutes. And sure enough, somebody came to get a workout in the last 15 minutes. And when that happened, my supervisor came knocking on my door and said, what are you doing? And I said, look, man, nobody can get a workout in, in the last 10 or 15 minutes. He said, I'm paying you for your time not to think. I was like, oh, so I'm selling my time for these dollars. I I know that you make certain amount of money per hour, but I didn't really translate the two. It was at that point I was like, man, I don't ever want to have to be in a specific place at a specific time in order to earn money anymore. So I got really interested in real estate. And I think every entrepreneur should be looking for something that has some form of a subscription component to it where you get some recurring income on a monthly basis, regardless of what product or service you render, you, you want to be able to get that money flowing. And so I, I got clarity around the need for that. And I just didn't know how to do it. I'm the son of a soldier and a stay at home mom. And so none of the folks that were owning multimillion dollar real estate portfolios were coming over to the cookout. I, maybe <laughs> you, you had those folks hanging out at your house, Josh, but I didn't. No. And so I didn't know who to ask on, well, how you do this thing. Yeah. And so I finished school, but it, it was like, man. So these nuggets along the way from my mom in the front yard saying, hey, you probably don't want to be a trash man to this guy saying, I pay you for your time to this other guy saying, Hey, no, you're going to lay these people off. Ah, I, I, the buck had to stop with me in the end. Mm. So obviously then, you know, you, you made that decision. You're like, cool. I want to dive in and try to figure out real estate. 
how'd you get from like nothing to, you know, being able to build a multi-million dollar, blah, <laughs> multi-million dollar portfolio? <laughs> yeah. A, a bunch of mistakes, a bunch of hitting my head on, I, Josh, I wasn't smart enough to go ask somebody who'd already done it to help me. And mm. so I went to the banks and I'm proud of myself. I got my 50 page business plan and I said, Hey, don't you want to lend me a million dollars to buy this thing? And you're like, why would you do that? <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> I just ran a $20 million division. I got an MBA. Like I, I, I got a engineering license. I got these things. And you're like, yeah, right. we don't care about any of that. And it was like, well, what do you care about? And he's like, well, we want to know that you, you've done what you want us want to borrow money from us to do. I was like, wait, so how do I get experience if I don't have experience? <laughs> and they're <laughs> yeah. like, go partner with somebody. I said, but I don't know anybody. And they said, that's not our problem. Go find somebody who's done this before. <laughs> and so I had to pivot and then I started doing fixing and flipping, but I stayed close to real estate. And by continuing to do that, I had been to have somebody pull up to one of my flip houses. It was a $90,000 rehab project where that, that's just the construction piece. And it's a house that was built in 1920s and we do HVAC and electrical and plumbing and everything, take out walls. So the guy hops out his white Dodge Ram, walks up to me and says, Hey, but I, I want to see your finishes because we're going to do one down the street. I said, okay. And I'm feeling proud because this is the first time somebody wanted to see my work. I'm like, yeah. It's a big project. Yeah, you should want to see my stuff. And so we're walking through. He's like, man, you took the walls out and you got the granite and that's not level one. That's like level six. And you got the gooseneck sink and, ooh, this tile in the bathroom is pretty solid, man. We're going to have, maybe have to step up our game a little bit. Like, okay. <laughs> and so he's getting ready to walk out the door, Josh, and he stops and he says, hey, do you know anything about that building behind the Chimbo Mart? I was like, Yeah. I tried to buy that four or five months ago. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to make an offer on it today. It's like, please don't leave me out. You're the guy I've been looking for. The bank told me I needed a partner. You're the guy. And sure enough, he asked, well, what are you going to bring to the table? I said, I don't, I don't know. But we'll figure it out. Don't leave me out. The bank said I needed to meet you so that you could help me do the deal. And we went around and around. Of course, he left me out. Because <laughs> I couldn't articulate <laughs> my value. I couldn't articulate my value. And I tell that story because that point is really important to everybody that is sure. in entrepreneurship. You have to be able to tell people what problem you can solve for them. You need to be listening closely enough to know what problem they have so that you can help them. It's not charity. They're not just going to partner with you for the sake of partnering with you because everybody they bring to the table that is dead weight takes money out their pocket and reduces the effectiveness of the project. And so eventually I got back to the deal because I was a hard money lender to somebody else that ended up being in the deal. And they said they would only do it if I was in it. And then my name ended up in the paper when we closed. And then the bankers wanted to call me because, well, we had closed the deal. And so now I had experience, even though I didn't know much more than I knew the <laughs> year before when I went to talk to them. And then we did more deals and then it, it continued to snowball off of that. But the seeds that I had planted along the way were the things that led to the opportunity and not giving up when I got told no, not the first time, the second, third or fourth time, not even the 10th time is the thing that allowed me to get to the place where we actually were able to do the deals and build the portfolio. No, that's, that's awesome. And obviously uh, as you were, trying to figure all this out and, and, and put things together um, and figure it out on your own because you didn't have a mentor. Um, obviously, you ran into probably different challenges along the way, uh, you know, whether it's rehabbing, whether it's putting your first deals together and everything. What were kind of some of these challenges and then what did you do to work through them? Yeah, for that first deal, we did everything wrong. We didn't get permits before we closed and oh. <laughs> we put – in pipes that were not permitted the inspector found them and made us pull them out because they didn't meet code we had contractors that didn't perform we had a contract we had another contractor who went bankrupt on us in the middle of the project uh you name it we we did a business plan where we were only going to renovate when people left like their leases expired and we non-renewed them and instead of that we ended up evicting everybody 
and having to pay the mortgage out of pocket instead of oh. having the residents pay it for us while we made the transition. I mean, we did everything wrong, Josh. And we made it through and we just sold it. And so this was a property where we bought it for $55,000 a door and we sold it for one fifty six a couple of months ago, a door. Nice. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we still made really, really good money, but the issues were the issues. And I see a lot of people trying to do things with zero margin for safety. And I, mm-hmm. I can't emphasize this enough to your community. If you are doing something for the first time, make sure there's, and this is a technical term, make sure there's some squishy in your pro forma and your projections. Cause if there's not, then it's very likely that you're going to lose money. And I've just watched so many people do it where everything had to work perfectly in order for things to come out favorably. And when that happens, they end up losing money and it's usually not just their money that they end up losing. Yeah. I think that's super important is, is we don't look at the different contingencies and then, and the different uh, things that may come up. Cause we're like, Oh, this is going to be amazing. We're going to do, you know, uh, and figure this all out. And, you know, and, even though that as we're doing it through the first time, there's always going to be issues. <laughs> there's, it's not that it's just the way it works. And uh, especially as an entrepreneur. And so uh, I think that's, you know, definitely great. What were some of like your top three things that you've kind of learned along this journey? Figuring it out on your own is the most inefficient and ineffective way to do it. Right. This step one, you can condense time frames. You can keep, from scraping up your knees and destroying your elbows by getting somebody and paying them to help Mm. you do something that they've already done. That will take you further faster than anything else you can do. I think the second thing is many people go out into the world and they want to do it on their own. They want to be self-made and it's just idiotic, right? Nobody gets to where they are on their own. Nobody truly is self-made. And if you hear them say that, know that they won't be where they are very long because they're probably a narcissist. And I wish that I could say it more politely, but I I just don't have a single example that makes that statement untrue. And I think the final thing is you have to believe in your dreams so much that other people may believe that you're not sane. Like you have to know, you have to be so convinced and convicted that the thing can happen for you because there's going to be so many things that go wrong where it's going to be easy for you to turn around. I call it going into the desert. And so I think most people sit in a jungle where there's shade, there's water, there's fruit, and there's really no reason to leave it because it's good. And then I think some of us are wild enough to walk out into the desert where resources are scarce and sparse and you got to make that journey across the desert to find your oasis. And that allows you to refuel, get yourself back together. And then from the oasis, I think if you have a skilled guide with you, you'll make it a paradise. And once you experience paradise, the good that you experience in the jungle will see you. You'll ask how you ever lived that way. And you know, you, you got the shirt on that says free. Uh, it, most people have never experienced freedom, but when you get there and you actually taste that, you drink of that cup, it, your life is forever changed. And so, yeah, man, uh, I think making sure you have somebody to go on that journey with you is probably the most important thing, followed by uh, this conviction that you are going to be successful and you're willing to go to extreme links in order to make that happen. That's definitely awesome and so true with the fact that entrepreneurship's lonely in general. So, you know, if you can find somebody that you team up with or, you know, take the journey with you and stuff, it makes it fun. It makes it able to get through those challenges and some of those trying times even, you know, better, you know, than it would be just, you know, on your own. Obviously, you got, you know, you've developed a lot of experience now and, and, you know, owning multifamily and things like that. What was kind of that four step process that you put together to owning and, you know, operating, you know, your multifamily units? Yeah, I appreciate you asking that. Um, I think this will help people a lot. So, and it, it doesn't really matter whether it's multifamily, single family, any type of real estate, most businesses in general. So you want to find it, then you want to fund it, fix it, and then flip it. Flip mm. it does not mean that you have to sell it. You can refinance it. But the goal here is to get the original investment out. So 
every deal, regardless of what people think, they happen in that order. You first, you got to find it. Then you want to fund it. That means if you need partners, if you need to bring capital, whatever it is, you, you, you put that together at that point, your business plan as well. And then you actually execute the business plan, increasing net operating income, regardless of what the business is. And then you want to get your initial investment back out and then play with house money in the deal. No, I mean, that, that sounds like super simple, but it was probably a, <laughs> a long, hard process to kind of get that all figured out, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were doing it and we didn't know we were doing it. And I had a good friend, Dr. James Bryan, who pointed it out. And I was like, oh, this does make a lot of sense. And it works over and over again. It's a repeatable process. And if you, if you stay within that framework, you'll be efficient and you'll be effective. Super cool. Uh, so we got just a couple minutes left. Uh, guys, I hope you guys are really paying attention to what Jerome's talking about today. And listen to some of those different stories that he said. There's a lot of different uh, awesome nuggets that he's planted for you throughout this conversation. So listen, watch this again, rewind it, uh, ch you know, take those notes as you're listening and watching this and really pay attention to what he's saying and then start taking those and applying those to what you're doing in business or life or whatever that may be um, to help you, you know, get, get ahead in, in everything that you're doing. So what's one last thing before we wrap up here, Drew? I'm just, you're like, oh man, I was hoping Josh was going to ask me this question or I just really want to share this before we wrap up that you want to kind of get out to our audience. Yeah, uh, your dream should be real. And if nobody's told you that and you got to this point of the episode, well, now you're convicted by it. I think so many of us live in a world where we've been told that we need to be practical, we need to be realistic, but nothing special comes from those places. What you need to be is radical. What you need to be is a, a little uh, obsessed with creating these outcomes for whoever you've been placed on this earth to serve. You not pursuing and catching your dream is potentially preventing somebody else from being able to do what they're supposed to do. Each of these things is a something that I, I struggle with and it keeps me up at night because I know there's so many people doing work that they're not passionate about and they're only doing it because it pays well. And they're asking the question, what's it all for? Or is this it? And the reality is, that that's not what you're here for. And if you're not on purpose and in purpose, then you're wasting the most precious gift that you have, and that's your time. And so if you aren't an entrepreneur and you've been thinking about it, it's time to do something. If you are an entrepreneur and you're not performing at your highest level, then I think you're making a mistake and we got to figure out how to get you on and in purpose. Awesome. So true. And where can people get more information or see what you got going on? Yeah, JeromeMyers.co. Everything is there. All free, free, free twelve-step processes, all checklists, all kinds of amazing content to help people get to where they want to be on their journey. Awesome, Jerome. Uh, thank you for your time today. Super cool to have you on Making Bang, sharing your insights, and I uh, just really appreciate it. Josh, this was awesome. Thanks for having me, man. I am Josh Felbert. You are watching Making Bank. Get out and be extraordinary. <laughs>